Welcome to the Matt Kuda Photography Podcast, a podcast about nature and wildlife photography in your own backyard and throughout the United States. Okay, welcome back to the podcast, episode 37, Autofocus. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a couple minutes to apologize, first of all, for not getting these episodes out faster. I really do apologize. It's not at all the way I had hoped things would go this year. Unfortunately, my situation with my day job has become more difficult. Um, it's And so I'm unable to provide the podcast episodes um, as frequently as I would like. So just bear with me. I will put them out as quickly as I possibly can and hopefully have just as good of uh, topics and and we'll move forward as we can. Um, just bear with me and you know you, I know you understand you have your day jobs as well so but hopefully everything will, will work out fine. This episode is about autofocus. Autofocus is one of these things that we all claim to love, but we all kind of don't fully understand what's going on sometimes I think. When I talk about autofocus, I talk, I'm talking primarily about the DSLR's autofocus system. And most DSLRs use what's called phase detect AF or phase detect autofocus system. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of a difficult concept to, to understand, uh, the phase detect. So I'll try to do it justice. I'll try to actually explain this stuff as well as I can. Autofocus is very technical at its at its component level and, and firmware level and software level and so forth. So hopefully I can do it justice here. Essentially, what phase detect is, is as the light passes through your lens, so the light's coming through your lens, enters your camera body, the light strikes the main mirror so that when you take your lens off, you'll see that, that big mirror sitting in there. As the light strikes that, some of the light is allowed to pass through a transparent part of that main mirror. This light is then routed down to another smaller mirror and reflected into a dedicated AF sensor. The autofocus points that show up on your sensor are linked to the smaller autofocus sensor. There's really a, a lot of mathematics that's done at this point um, as far as a grid system and the points of the grid and so on and so forth. I'm not going to get into all that. But what you need to know is there's a couple key points. One is that light is being siphoned from your main mirror and pushed down to another mirror, which is then shined through some photo sensors onto the sensor itself. So because of that, it becomes imperative that you have a lens that is fast. Now, what do I mean by fast? I don't want to say it's imperative. F-stop has everything to do with this. So when you hear someone say, I shoot with an F4 lens because it gives me more, more light is allowed to enter through the camera and to my autofocus system. Okay, so if I shoot an F4 lens, in theory, because it lets more light through, it'll actually be a faster focusing lens. Isn't always true, but in theory, that's what should happen. Because remember, it's siphoning light. Your, ca your camera body is actually siphoning light off, so it can go to the separate smaller sensor just to calculate the autofocus. If you shoot a f2.8 lens, the autofocus gets even better in theory because you're letting in even more light. Well, you say to me, wait a minute, but I'm shooting at F8. Wouldn't, how would that, wouldn't that work against me? Or what if I have, no, it has nothing to do with the F-stop that is your camera stopping down to. It's, it's the aperture. When you take a photograph, let me back up here a little bit. If you have an F2.8 lens, and I am focused, let's say I'm focused on a bird 20 feet away. All that light is pouring through my lens as I'm pointing it at my subject. That light is pouring through that F2.8 opening, which is wide open. And then that light, a portion of it is siphoned off. 
okay? So the more light you have entering that lens at that time, the better your chances of having successful autofocus. Now, notice I said at that time, when you actually depress your shutter button, your lens will stop down to whatever aperture you have selected. So if I, if I for example, had F8 chosen, because f 8s a great aperture to use for bird photography, then it would stop down and take the picture. That doesn't affect autofocus. The light coming in through your lens initially is what affects autofocus. When you actually take the photograph, that does not affect it. So I want to I want to draw that distinction because a lot of people get confused between well, but if I'm shooting at f8, will my autofocus work as good? Yes, it will. If I'm shooting at f11, will, will my autofocus work as good? Yes, it will, because it's using that initial light coming in through your f2.8 opening. Conversely, if I were to shoot with my f6.3 lens, then my autofocus could struggle, especially under lower light conditions. And so this is one of the reasons that people like F4 lenses and F2.8 lenses. It's not always because they want to have a higher shutter speed, although that is part of the equation. Sometimes they do it to have better autofocus speeds. Okay, so that's one key takeaway from the phase detect AF. The second key point to consider is that the more autofocus points your camera supports, the more complex the logic and the more processing power is needed. Bigger processors, bigger cost, okay? Bigger buses are needed. More, um, more horsepower is needed, so higher end processors are needed. This is why high end cameras cost so much. They have dual processors that are very expensive. They have big buses, they have all this stuff to make, make it so they can autofocus faster. Okay, so that's phase detect AF. That is what you have inside your DSLR. Now, yes, you do have uh, another type of autofocus. We're not gonna talk about that here today, but I just wanna talk about phase detect. Okay, moving on. We know we have a phase detect system. What about the sensors in that phase detect system? In other words, there are two types of sensors primarily, and I'm, I'm, try, I'm gonna try to not get too in depth on this. Uh, there are two types of sensors. There's the cross type, which is the newest type of, of sensor, and there's the horizontal or standard sensor. The standard sensor is what we've had for many, many years since autofocus came out. Um, it is It focuses on the horizontal plane. It doesn't take into effect both the X and Y axis. So it is inferior in that sense. Can you still take still take great photographs using just the standard sensors? Yes, absolutely. That's ridiculous. There's another one called the cross type sensor though. And the cross type sensor provides focusing on the vertical and horizontal planes at a single cross point. And the way I like to think of a cross type, and maybe this is the wrong way to think of it, but for me, it helps. I think of crosshairs, you know, like crosshairs on a bomb site or on a gun site or something like that on your favorite uh, first person shooter Xbox game. That's kind of what a cross type is. It's, it's going to take into effect the light on both of those planes. And so it's naturally going to be faster because it's looking at X and Y. My 7D, for example, has 19 cross point uh, sensors. So Whenever you can use one of these cross types, you're going to have better autofocus performance. So when you're buying a camera and you're, if you want to be a wildlife photographer and you're buying a camera, you definitely want to look for a camera that has quite a few cross types. The third type is called a high pre precision point. And what this is, is this is something that Canon has. I'm, I'm sure Nikon has it as well. It is a, a point or points on your phase detect sensor that is precision. In other words, it is mathematically amazing. But the caveat is it's usually just one sensor. Most of the most cameras only have one 
high precision point. Now, some of the newer ones have many, but most cameras that you'll find in the used market, for example, will have one, and it's usually the center point. Now, it gets even more complicated because the high precision point is only effective with certain types of lenses. So, for example, some of them are high precision at f4 or 2.8, depending on the camera model. And so if you happen to be using a 2.8 lens, then your center point becomes even more amazing. So they're optimized for these, these different lenses. Okay, so that's your sensors. We've talked about the phase detect system overall. We've talked about the different uh, types of sensors. Let's move on to more practical autofocus ideas. Primarily, you're going to deal with two autofocus modes, if you will. Let's call them modes. There is one-shot autofocus or single servo on a Nikon, and there is AI server autofocus or a continuous servo on the Nikon. By the way, I like the Nikon naming better. I think uh, Canon was was drunk, I think, when they came up with the names for their autofocus modes. Anyway, um, one shot, or single servo, is designed to be used with very slow-moving subjects or static subjects. So if I was photographing a flower... For example, I would use a one-shot autofocus. If I was using, or if I were shooting um, an animal that was stationary, I might use one-shot autofocus. So, oftentimes, out of the box, your camera will also beep in this mode. So, um, if you have a Canon, you'll hear that beep. You know, when it when it when the focus locks on, it'll go beep. You know, and so you know you're in focus. That is annoying, but it's a good learning tool uh, when you first start out. Uh, one shot is uh, kind of where everybody usually starts, and then you learn later that you need other modes. The second mode is AI server autofocus. I mean servo, excuse me. AI servo autofocus. Continuous servo on Nikon. This is where I live. This is the mode I live in. And I'll tell you why, and it's going to make more sense later. But AI Servo is a continuous tracking servo motor, basically. So when you hold when you hold down your, your shutter button or your back focus button, it's continually trying to find focus. And why is that important? Well, when you have a subject running, say you have a football player running at you, or a football player running from left to right, if you hold down that button, it's going to continuously track that subject. And you can actually see it if you look closely while, while it's doing it. Or if you use an older lens, you can actually hear it going zip, 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 as it tries to constantly focus to achieve, to achieve lock. Now, with the one shot, it doesn't do that, right? With the one shot, it goes beep, and you're done. As long as you hold that button down, it will not try to refocus. If you want to refocus, you have to lift your finger up off the button and touch it halfway down again. That's the only way that you can you can achieve focus again. So you can see how that's impractical when you have a moving subject because by the time you lift your finger up and hit focus again, the subject's already moved on. So they came out with this AI servo and that totally is the the right way to go with with fast moving animals, people running. Heck, I even use it honestly. I even use it for as a single ser as a uh, single uh, servo or a one shot, you can leave it on that mode continuously if you want to. The disadvantage is that if you're not going to use a burst mode, if you're not going to shoot a burst of images, and you're using that, you can get out of focus images because it's zipping back and forth really fast trying to lock on, and you could have shots that were not totally in focus. So that's why I recommend if you're using if you're shooting a macro shot or something like that, you should use the one shot or even manual focus. So that's that's the two the two big guns. That's probably the one thing if 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 you could only learn one thing from this podcast episode, I would say learn the difference between one shot and AI servo and when and when not to use them. Okay, let's move on. 
Canon autofocus settings. I'm going to not do Nikon. I'm not familiar with Nikon enough to do it here. I'm sure they have similar, similar comparable settings. But I just want to go through what Canon has to offer. Canon has several like grouping settings, what I call group settings. They're not they're mo I don't I don't want to use the word mode because we just use the word mode for autofocus. This is actually the ability to change your autofocus point grouping. So there are five modes generally, and sometimes more with some of the newer cameras. The first type of grouping is called spot AF. And spot AF is like taking a single point AF point and going even smaller. It's, it fits inside of the single point. It is for very precise focusing. Uh, it is not recommended for fast moving subjects. Canon does not recommend it for that because it's too hard to keep the autofocus point on the subject. Um, do I ever use this? No, I really don't. Uh, is, are there uses for it? Oh, I'm sure there are. Um, if I have to get that precise, usually I'll zoom in using live view and manually focus. Okay, the second group group setting is single point. Single point is your friend. Single point is probably my favorite and most used autofocus grouping. When do I use it? Okay, it's it. If you look through your viewfinder, you'll know right away that you're in single point because when you depress your your shutter release halfway you'll see it light up as one little box on your screen that's it it's just one little box and you can move your joystick on the back you can move that around to get to the part on your subject that you want to be in focus so how do i use this i actually use that joystick all the time i mean i am constantly using that joystick and this is one of the reasons that you want to to practice with your camera because that should be automatic. You should be able to touch the uh, autofocus point selector button and then use the joystick to quickly find your single point and shoot, focus and shoot. Um, why would you use this on wildlife? Um, well, it, it's really quite simple. One, wildlife and humans too as well. Um, you want to focus on their eyes. And the way that you focus on their eyes is by using this single point selection. So let's say I was taking a picture of a black bear and he was cooperative. Maybe it was a captive black bear. I would position my autofocus point directly on his eye and then depress my shutter button halfway down, focus and fire. Why wouldn't I want to use another mode here? Well, if you use another mode that has more points, then you run the risk of it focusing somewhere else. It might focus on his nose, might focus on his ear, it might focus anywhere but his eye, it might focus on his eyebrow, you know, you don't want that kind of stuff going on. So single point is, is a professional photographer and serious amateur photographer's friend, especially wedding photographers, wildlife, sports, um, all these types of action photography is, is essential. Now, where do you run into problems with it? Well, it's hard to keep it on your subject. So when you have a fast moving subject, for example, I was photographing chimney swifts um, up at Hanging Rock State Park. And they're fun to do. They're very difficult to photograph. Um, but you don't want to use a single point because they're so erratic that you would never be able to lock on. I mean, and when you do lock on, they're going to move so fast that you're not going to be able to do it. So that's a perfect example where a single point wouldn't work. But now if I'm in Orlando and I'm photographing, um, you know, wood storks taking off from their nests, single point would work perfectly for that. You could lock onto their head, hopefully their eye if possible, and get a great shot without, wor without worrying about focusing on their wing or their you know, their foot or something like that. The third type of group setting is the single point expand. This is another one of my favorites that I use, and I use this for birds in flight frequently. What this is, it's a single point. So when you, 
when you're moving your joystick around your image and you're moving that that single point AF sensor around and let's say well let's just let's just forget about all that for a second let's just say that you are photographing a bird in flight and you're having a hard time keeping that keeping these birds autofocus point on their head what you can do is switch to single point expand that's the single point so it's that one autofocus plus four around it so what it does is when I'm photographing let's say a roseate spoonbill flying across in front of me from left to right I have my single point focus on his head but when I had the expand mode engaged if I happen to move my camera slightly off from his head one of the surrounding four autofocus points will pick it up there's a handoff from that that central single point it's handed off to one of the peripheral uh, single points so I really like that because that's a common problem that you have is is maybe they turn sharply suddenly or maybe you know your arms are getting tired as the day wears on that can be a very very handy tool in that case so I definitely recommend single point expand on the 7D it works really good and so far it's working good on the on my 1D Mark III. The fourth type of group setting is Zone AF. Now Zone AF is one of these things that to me sounded really really good until I used it. Um, Zone AF is is more as as is common on the newer cameras. It didn't used to exist. I think it came out on the 7D. I could be wrong about that, but it was right around that time frame, 2008-ish, somewhere around there. Um, and what it does is your camera is divided up into sections. So there's a left section, a center section, and a right section. And what you can do is you can select, say, the right, only the right autofocus points. And that becomes a zone. And so if your bird flies into that zone, the autofocus points pick them up and take a picture. You can set it to the left, to the right, to the center. Sometimes with the newer ones, you can set the upper zone, lower zone. I am told that some photographers have good luck with this when they're shooting birds in flight against a blue sky. Um, I have not had a lot of luck with it, I'll be honest with you. I've tried it in various situations. I just... Yeah, I, I don't I don't really have use for it, to be honest with you. But it's there. You may enjoy it. You may like it. Feel free to experiment with it. That's just my opinion. The fifth type are all points. So all of your autofocus points are used when needed. So this is kind of an automatic mode, if you will. When you set it to this, your camera just decides based on the subject, the background, all of these things. It computes where it thinks the autofocus point should go. Well, it sounds like a good idea until you're shooting something against the woods or you're shooting something where other subjects are moving in between your primary subject and it starts switching back and forth. Again, where I am told that photographers have used this successfully is when shooting against the blue sky. And I have actually used it successfully in this scenario. Where I used this was when I was shooting the, chim the chimney swifts again. I set, to, I set it to all points and it was actually picking up the chimney swifts and was doing a, you know, a decent job uh, with a bird that flies ridiculously fast. Um, the biggest thing with chimney swifts is not getting the autofocus lock Although that's very challenging, the biggest problem is having a high enough shutter speed. You need to be up there around four thousandths of a second uh, to get them to, to stop action. This uh, this all points is sometimes, refer especially on the one series, is often referred to as the ring of fire. And the reason it's called the ring of fire is when you switch over to all points, all of the peripheral autofocus points light up to tell you that you're in that mode and it creates a ring of red. Um, so do I recommend all points? I think in some scenarios it works great. For everyday use, no. I think everyday use you're gonna wanna look at using the single point autofocus and the single point expand. Um, definitely, definitely worth worth your effort to learn those two, those two uh, groupings. 
Okay, so that's the autofocus modes and the setting, the group settings. What's all this talk about back button focus? Okay, you, you probably heard me talk about it. I've explained it before, but I thought this was a good place to explain it again. Okay, back button focus is simply this. It allows you to use another button on your camera to decouple the focusing from your shutter release. So you know how typically when a camera comes to you by default, if you hold down the shutter button halfway, it focuses, right? And so it's difficult to focus and recompose. Now, you can hold it down halfway, get get a lock on your subject, and then you can move your camera. As long as you keep it held down halfway, you can move your camera around. Well, that gets cumbersome, and a lot of people, a lot of photographers don't like that, right? So they came up with this notion called back button focus. What you do is you actually, and the camera differs on how to set it up. Some of the older cameras use a different method than the newer cameras do. So I'm not going to get into that minutia. What I am going to explain is generally how it works. So you can go into your settings and you can dedicate one of your back buttons. Usually people will use the, uh, the AE lock button, the star asterisk button on the back of their camera. And sometimes the AF on button is used. But I use the star button, the asterisk button. And what this allows you to do is it gives you full flexibility. So let's say I'm photographing a waterfall. Okay, this is a perfect scenario for back button autofocus. I'm photographing this waterfall. And before me is a beautiful waterfall that cascades down into a creek. And I want to get maximum depth of field. So I focus on a boulder. I use my autofocus, my single point AF. I focus on that boulder about a quarter of the way into my into my shot. And I then use my shutter release to take the shot. It will not autofocus again because I have back button autofocus. I have pressed my back focus auto button, autofocus button. It has focused on the rock. Now I can release the shutter. In the old days what you had to do is you had to focus on the rock and then switch off your autofocus to manual focus on the actually switch off the switch on the side of your lens from autofocus to manual and then you could take your shot so this totally decouples all that you no longer have to worry about it so that's why a lot of photographers like it and I I actually do use this uh, I'm actually a proponent of using this system once you get used to it and it does it does take some there is a learning curve here it, it does take muscle memory change it takes kind of a, a rethinking of your whole process. But once you get used to it, I found it to be very, very useful. Um, I do recommend it. And if, if you want more information on it, you can Google it, shoot me an email, whatever. I'll be more than happy to fill you in. Okay, the, the last thing I want to talk about, about AF, and this gets tricky. And frankly, I don't know if I can do it justice here. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of the most frequent uh, types of AF cases. So we're gonna talk about autofocus cases. What does that mean? Inside your camera, especially if it's a newer version, you will have a couple, several features in there to adjust how your autofocus behaves, its overall behavior. And this trips a lot of people up. The newer cameras that Canon came out are very sophisticated. They have Lots of autofocus settings that, frankly, are confusing sometimes. One of the beautiful things about the old 1D Mark, Mark II was it didn't have a lot of these settings. And I think, honestly, I think people got better photographs with the 1D Mark II because they didn't have to tweak their camera to get everything right. But that I, you know, I digress on that. Um, the first thing and the most important thing I want to talk about is a setting called tracking sensitivity. Tracking sensitivity. What does this do? Well, when you're autofocusing on a subject, let's say, again, we use our, our songbird scenario. I've got a songbird 20 feet away. 
I've got my 600 millimeter at 600. I'm going to take the shot. I autofocus on the bird's eye, but suddenly the bird flies away. I've still got my back focus button held down. The bird suddenly flies away and my dumb lens focuses on the background immediately, focuses on the background. Now I've lost my, my 20 feet focus range and it's gone to infinity on me and I'm mad. Well, that's what this is for. That's what tracking sensitivity is for. If you turn it to the less sensitive, and each camera has a little different nomenclature here on this, but you know some of them have a little graph back there where you can turn it to less sensitive or more sensitive. If you turn it less sensitive, the scenario, scenario I just described probably wouldn't have happened. Let's go back to the scenario. I'm, I've got my bird 20 feet away. I've auto-focused, but I've turned down my tracking sensitivity. Now, when the bird flies and I've still got my back button focus held down, it takes it a second or two, depending on how your tracking sensitivity is set up, to switch to that background. So chances are the bird flies away, I immediate, re immediately release my thumb, and it doesn't focus on the background. So if I had my sensitivity turned all the way up, as soon as that bird flew away, it would focus on the woods in the background, for example. So you can see there, that can be a big time saver, right? What happens, and I've had this happen. I had this happen recently with my 1D Mark III. It's very frustrating. You're sitting there and, you know, of course, nine times out of 10 when this happens, right? Another bird flies in. Some bird you haven't seen in like five years flies in. And you're, you're goofing around trying to get the dumb thing to refocus at 20 feet again. And because you didn't have that tracking sensitivity set right, you lose the shot. That's what we're trying to avoid here by using this. Every pro I know of uses this to, in various ways. Um, they may, depending on the subject, they may turn it up, they may turn it down. Most pros, including myself, will turn down the sensitivity a little bit, maybe not a lot, but at least a little bit so that they're not having that focus shift all the time because that's just not, not cool. Okay. So that's the most important AF case. The other AF case that you'll run into is acceleration deceleration. And I wanted to talk about this because this is one of the most confusing. Basically what happens here is that if the subject's an erratic subject, if it's flying erratically, for example, or moving erratically, you want to use higher acceleration, okay? What you'll notice, though, when you use higher acceleration is it gets kind of flaky on you. It, it, it twitches back and forth trying to focus too quickly. So you may want to adjust that slightly one way or the other. I think I'm pretty much leaving it in the middle at this point. I'm not really doing that much with it. But the problem is if it moves too quickly, again, you get into one of those scenarios where you're jumping out of focus and in focus too much. So be careful with that mode. That's why I wanted to bring that one up. <clears throat> there are other cases in, uh, you know, in the modern cameras. I'm not going to touch on those here today. It's, we're getting a little long here on this podcast. But it's, you know, all you got to do is Google your camera model and they'll come up with a ton of videos on camera settings. But that's about it for that's about it for autofocus. I mean, you, you you know, like I said, if you got nothing out of this, at least realize that you really need to understand autofocus modes. So the one shot and the AI servo, you really need to get into that. Watch some YouTube videos, listen to the podcast again, whatever it takes to get you there. Um, I realize this is kind of more of a beginner's look at this. And I did that on purpose. We've had a lot of philosophical episodes lately. We've had a lot of um, just gr probably, you know, more deeper, um, like I said, philosophical or even even look looking at, you know, various types of cameras and things like that. So I thought this would be something that a beginner could pick up better. And I know that several of you out there are beginners because I've, you know, I get your emails and I... And I see some, you know, a couple survey results out there. So, you know, I, I thought this would be more useful.
the sound you just heard was that of the wood stork. The wood stork, according to Cornell's Lab of Ornithology, is a large, white, bald-headed wading bird of the southeastern swamps. The wood stork is the only stork breeding in the United States. Its late winter breeding season is timed to the Florida dry season, when its fish prey become concentrated in shrinking pools. The wood stork. I first uh, ran across the wood stork a few years back at a place called Huntington Beach State Park, South Carolina. This is a state park just south of Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And there was a flock of wood storks there. I'd never seen them before. I had not done, at this point, I had not done any Florida birding. So, you know, I was seeing some of these birds for the first time. They're a wading bird. They're a typical wading bird in a lot of ways. They'll stand right there looking for fish. They won't move for a while sometimes. They're, in some ways, they're an attractive bird. They have some very interesting plumage, but their heads are more... To me, they have more of a vulture look in the head than maybe an old world vulture kind of look. Um, but they're an interesting bird. Don't know why I think that, but I just do. I just find them interesting. I like to photograph them when I can. I've got some shots of them from Florida. Uh, they're common in the Merritt Island, Florida area, uh, Gatorland. Um, it's common to see them there nesting. So, I mean, very very easy to find as long as you're in the southeast of the United States. But that's pretty much it for for this episode. That's pretty much it for Know Your Subject. Pretty much it for Autofocus. Um, keep up the, the work that you're doing is, and getting the word out. Um, like I said, I'll do my, I'll do my uh, best to get these episodes out as quickly as possible without sacrificing the quality so much. I, I worry about the quality, so I don't want to just crank out a you know crank out one just for the sake of cranking one out i want it to be have some good information in it at least uh, at least one or two good facts so that's all i have for today thanks for listening make it a great day and get out there and enjoy nature bye bye Music for this episode was provided by Dr. Turtle.